All right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm noticing that on my clock, it's already 1245. So I think we'll get started with our second session of summer student presentations. Before we get started, just want to quickly remind you that um, that we love for you to vote for your favorite st summer student presentation. Um, that student will win the People's Choice Award. Uh, the link will be on the chat. Thank you, Christine. So make sure you vote before the end of our student presentations. Alrighty, so I think we'll get started with our first speaker. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer from the Yachi Lab at UBC, and I'm working on developing a new cell lineage tracing technology. Next slide. Cell lineage tracing is trying to map how every cell divides and differentiates through the mammalian development. Current strategies such as live imaging and using fluorescent proteins suffer from low resolution and we cannot differentiate mother from daughter cells. Another strategy called DNA barcoding achieves single cell resolution by having a DNA sequence that accumulates mutations during each cell division. So each cell has their unique barcode. Because mother cells mutations are passed on to the daughters, the cell lineage information can then be reconstructed. Next slide, please. My project involves engineering a new barcoding system via VDG recombination, which humans use to generate antibody diversity. The red proteins in orange are like the scissors that finds the recognition sequence shown in a uh, triangle. They cut them off and join the DNA back together. And then the protein called TDT in blue can insert random DNA base pairs when the DNA is cut. And after joining, you have a random barcode region inserted by TDT that is unique to each cell. Next slide, please. The overall project goal is to develop a high resolution autonomous system which can work in higher order organisms. And my summer project involves designing and constructing a reporter and conducting pilot experiments to test the effects of these proteins in cell lines. Next slide, please. So this is the reported plasmid which I designed and synthesized used to test the effects of the TT protein. Uh, without TDT, the red scissors cut and rejoin the DNA, resulting in a red fluorescent protein, and the cell will be red. If the TDT is present, it can insert nucleotides randomly, shifting the reading frame and produce a functional green fluorescent protein, resulting in a green cell. Next slide, please. And so the next steps of my project involves constructing variants of proteins and sequences to see which one will be better suited for our cell lineage tracing technology. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you very much. Next speaker. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Jonathan, a co-op student with the Zanster Lab, working on the modeling and growth control of functional patterns and expression domains within stem cell populations. Um, next slide, please. So we know that early cellular patterning during castration directs differentiation of embryonic cells into separate germ layers and subsequently all cell types within the body. Um, and throughout this summer, we have been interested in the mechanisms through which um, functional patterns and cellular domains expand uh, throughout development um, as well as how this could be applied in vitro in order to scale production of specialized cell types and functional tissues. Uh, next slide, please. So we started off by quantifying live imaging data of spatial brachial expression um, in castration-like patterns arising from micropatterned mouse pluripotent stem cell colonies. And what we found was that the growing areas of brachial expression over time actually scaled with the size of the micro pattern. So what this would imply is that these cells somehow 
have knowledge of their spatial surroundings and constraints, um, and thus adapt the size of these expression patterns accordingly. However, um, this begs the important question of how these cells gain the spatial awareness um, and knowledge of the micro pattern or colony size. Next slide, please. So we then calculated the growth rates of brachyurea expression domains across um, micro patterns of varying sizes and actually found that they all follow the same set of complex dynamics. Um, we then attempted to quantify the expansion of upstream BMP patterns via a two species Turing reaction diffusion model. And we were fascinated to see that the results of uh, our simulations actually produce the exact same types of dynamics and scaling that we observe experimentally. So based on these results, we are currently hypothesizing that a simple Turing mechanism of upstream BMP patterning is sufficient to explain the scaling and growth behaviors of brachyurea expression domains um, arising from pluripotent stem cells. Um, and in addition, we are currently conducting experiments in order to validate this model, as well as to determine the exact relation between regions of BMP production and brachyurea expression. Thanks for listening, everyone. And I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you very much. And yes, please do put in your questions in the chat box and we will answer, we will ask them to our group of summer students in um, after two more students present. So thanks, Jonathan. All right, next speaker. Hello, everyone. My name is Karen and I'm from the Shakiba lab. Today I'll be presenting on clonal interactions between normal and abnormal human pluripotent stem cells. Next slide, please. So I work with human pluripotent stem cells, which is a special type of cell that can make copies of itself or differentiate into any cell type. Because of this flexibility, they have useful applications in regenerative medicine, disease modeling, and drug screening. Next slide, please. Stem cells are commercially grown in large bioreactors. However, naturally occurring mutations cause abnormal cells to appear, which overtake stem cell cultures. Previously, it was assumed that these abnormal cells took over the population only because of a growth advantage. However, it has recently been shown that abnormal cells bully and kill normal cells through contact-dependent killing. When this happens, the entire batch becomes unusable, and this problem leads to a waste in time, money, and resources. Next slide, please. So we designed an experiment to prove the impact of culture conditions on cell cell interactions between normal and abnormal cells. We first integrated fluorescent proteins into the DNA of each cell line, blue for normal and green for abnormal. Then we seeded them together at different densities with a one-to-one -one ratio. And then we tracked these cells over six days. The seeding density impacts the ability to form colonies because stem cells like to grow as clusters rather than alone. And this also impacts cell cell signaling and the access to nutrients in space. Next slide, please. So we took several snapshots of each wall over six days. These images here show the same spot in the well under the high density condition. And as you can see, there are a lot more abnormal green cells by the end of the six days. We can analyze the microscopy images to calculate the changes in the border of contact between the normal and the abnormal cells. Next slide, please. In the next stage of our project, we will be exploring how different seeding ratios impact interactions between normal and abnormal cells. We aim to identify how controllable parameters in the culture such as cell density and seeding ratios impact the ability for abnormal cells to kill their normal cell neighbors. Eventually, as a quality control measure, we can optimize these parameters to prevent abnormal cells from overtaking the culture. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to our next speaker. Hi, everyone. My name is Kira, and today I'll be discussing my summer work from Dr. Shunaz Bamji's lab at the Life Sciences Institute. The Bamji lab is research is primarily focused on the role of a specific type of lipid post-translational modification called palmitylation in synapse formation and plasticity. Next slide, please. So protein palmylation involves the reversible addition of a 16-carbon fatty acid group to cysteine residues of a substrate protein. 
And palmodulation is the most common form of lipid modification in the brain with 41% of synaptic proteins predicted to be substrates for palmodulation, suggesting a potentially important role for this post-translational modification in synaptic transmission and plasticity. Next slide, please. So to begin investigating the role of palmodulation in synaptic plasticity, a postdoc in the BAMG lab performed a proteomic screen shown here in which she sought to identify proteins whose palmodulation state changes in response to a learning paradigm called fear conditioning in mice. So from this screen, we identified 121 proteins whose palmodulation state differed between the fear conditioned and control groups. And next slide, please. We chose to focus on a specific protein in this list called PRG1, which had been previously shown to regulate presynaptic glutamate release and synaptic plasticity. And we hypothesized that activity-dependent palmodulation of PRG1 might be important for its function in plasticity. So the first objective of my summer project was to test this hypothesis in vitro using primary rat hippocampal neuronal cultures and a palmodulation-deficient PRG1 construct. Next slide, please. And I found that blocking palmodulation of PRG1 reduced the activity-dependent insertion of the glutamate receptor subunit, GLUA1, into the postsynaptic membrane, suggesting that dynamic PRG1 palmodulation is important for facilitating its role in synapse strengthening. Next slide, please. And then the second goal of my summer project was to test the hypothesis that palmodulation of PRG1 facilitates its role in synapse strengthening by enabling PRG1 synaptic recruitment, as measured by its co-localization with the postsynaptic marker PSD95. However, I found no changes in PRG1 co-localization with PSD95 before and after activity when using either the wild type or palmodulation deficient constructs, leaving open questions as to the mechanisms by which PRG1 palmodulation facilitates synapse strengthening. So thank you so much for listening and I look forward to taking any questions. Perfect, thanks. Alrighty. So we are now in our Q&A session. If you have any questions for Jennifer, Jonathan, Karen, or Kira, feel free to drop them in the chat box. All right, question for Karen. What are the differences between the abnormal and the normal cells? Are they both still pluripotent stem cells? Hey David, yes, they're both still pluripotent stem cells, but the abnormal cells have um, a deletion in the long arm of chromosome one, which was found through a karyotyping test. So that's the difference. Oh, and also the abnormal cells have been single cell adapted. So um, they basically are better suited to be growing um, under a single cell condition, whereas the other um, normal cell lines, they tend to be like, they prefer growing clusters, so we see them as clusters for the most part, but yeah. Great, thanks, Karen. All right, I guess for the other three, Jonathan, Karen, and Kira, my question to you all is, um, what was the, what did you enjoy the most about your project? So talked about, heard a little bit about the challenges that some of the summer students have gone through. What are some of your favorite moments with your project? We'll start with Jonathan. Sure, so yeah, what I really enjoyed about this project um, has so far has been, you know, being able to combine theoretical um, aspects um, with, you know, um, and putting that into practice through uh, computational uh, methods um, and analyses. Um, there have been some roadblocks, of course, um, particularly, I guess, with image analysis, we went through a lot of um, smoothing and denoising algorithms before we sort of settled on what um, we thought was ideal, but it's been, it's been a great experience. Sorry, you already had a question. Uh, Karen, you already answered the question. So, oh, sorry, I'll turn this back to Jennifer, actually. Yeah, uh, my favorite part was this was my first time working in the synthetic biology field, and I really enjoyed 
learning about it and trying all the techniques. And this was also a really independent project for me where a lot of the areas that I have to discover and explore myself. So I really enjoyed that part. One of the challenges, I guess it's occurring and troubleshoot, troubleshooting a lot of stuff that's occurring like errors occurring in unexpected areas. For example, I had like a deletion in the backbone that no one expected. Um, so that was one of the bigger challenges. Cool, great to hear about your experience. And Kira? Yeah, I think um, similar, <clears throat> excuse me, to what Jonathan said. I think originally last year, I had worked more on the sort of bioinformatics side of this paper or this project. Um, analyzing sort of the whole list of proteins. So I think it was nice to be able to transition that into the lab and do some validation um, to show that actually sort of um, when you're looking in vitro, you can see that this process is important for um, synaptic plasticity in with respect to a specific protein. And then, you know, that opens a lot of doors to potentially look at other proteins in that list and how um, their palm modulation might impact function as well. Cool, thanks, Kira. All right, we'll now move on to our next set of speakers. Take it away. Hello, everyone. My name is Kisa, and I am from the Trapini Lab. Next slide, please. My project goal this summer was to validate a tool for simultaneous visualization of over 15 different bacterial species so that we could get fundamental information about spatial organization in the gut. When you want to study an ecosystem, maybe uh, the forest or the ocean, you wanna know what animals are there, but you also know, wanna know where they are. This will tell you what they do in the ecosystem, how they are adapted for their habitat and how they interact with the other species. The microbiota in our gut is also its own complex ecosystem. It contains hundreds of species and knowing their location in the gut reflects important information about their function, physiology and interspecies interactions, which are then important for studying health and disease. The technique we are using for this tool is FISH, or fluorescent in situ hybridization, a technique for locating and detecting nucleic acid sequences that are of interest by using a fluorescent signal. Next slide. To achieve this goal, we started by designing unique probes for each of our species using a computational platform called OligoMiner. These probes contain a unique targeting sequence that targets the 16S ribosomal RNA in the bacteria, which is abundant and accessible. And it is combined with a readout sequence, which binds to a fluorescent probe and provides the signal. We then grew up all our strains of interest and prepared pure fixed cultures. These fixed cultures are utilized for high throughput assays in which each probe is tested against all the strains to quantify levels of on and off target labeling. Next slide. Here I have shown an example of what the imaging data looks like for one of our validation experiments. In green is a signal from the species-specific fish label. In red is an all bacteria fish label, which acts as our positive control by labeling all bacteria. And we also used a DNA stain called DAPI, seen in blue, to help us confirm the location of cells. Next slide. By designing and validating these probes, we are creating a well-characterized resource that can be used by researchers wanting to ask questions about bacterial distribution and composition, determining preferred niches of bacteria in the gut environment, studying interspecies interactions, and also discovering mechanisms by which spatial structure is altered, all to better understand our gut microbiota. Thank you. Great, fantastic. We will move on to our next speaker, please. So Lucas is um, out of, he's out of range for uh, presenting on video right now. So we, he pre-recorded his talk and we'll uh, play that now. And then Lucas will be available on audio to answer questions. My name is Lucas and I am a student in the Rossi lab. Here is a bit of my work looking at TAC1 signaling in mesenchymal stem cells and the type two inflammatory response. The inflammatory response is a key determinant of whether our body's response to infection will lead to regeneration or further damage. We can simplify the inflammatory response to a type one or a type two response. The type one response is an aggressive response which engages to fight off pathogens such as viruses. On the other hand, the type two response engages in response to infection by parasites or exposure to allergens. While both responses are important in our body, overactivation of either response may only serve to cause further damage and interfere with organ function. Thus, a proper balance is required between the two. 
Prior work from our lab shows that mesenchymal stem cells or MSCs, which are adult stem cells present in most tissues of our body, are critical in determining the prevalent type of response. And they control the type of response through interacting with our body's immune cells. However, the mechanism by which this occurs is unknown. In mice, we have discovered that the removal of a factor from these MSCs, known as TAC1, results in an excessive type 2 response. One of the most well-known diseases characterized by a type 2 inflammatory response is the allergic response, which can cause damage to our lungs. So we looked at the lungs of these TAC1 knockout mice and found that the knockout mice had a reduced lung capacity. In other words, their lungs could not hold as much air compared to those mice that did not have TAC1 knocked out. On a closer examination of the structure of these lungs, we saw increased inflammation in the TAC1 knockout mice, as shown from staining for inflammatory cells. Now, based on our earlier hypothesis that MSCs control the inflammatory response through communication with immune cells, we then tried to understand which factor was involved in mediating this communication. By removing a well-known receptor known as ST2, which is expressed on immune cells involved in the type 2 inflammatory response, we were able to decrease the type 2 response. In the lungs of these mice that had both TAC1 and ST2 knocked out, we saw a restoration of lung function. Examination of the structure of these lungs also showed us that inflammation that was seen before was completely reduced. Overall, our results provide us with a better understanding of how MSCs and immune cells communicate, which may help in the development of future MSC-based therapies to treat diseases. Great, thank you. And now we'll move on to our next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Lydia Lee, and today I'll present my research on microscopic examination of transmembrane protein that helps predict cystic fibrosis treatment outcomes. My supervisor is Dr. Robert Nabi, and I would like to thank CBR and SBME for organizing this event. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Cystic fibrosis is an inherited progressive disease caused by genetic mutation, and symptoms include persistent coughing with thick mucus and recurring lung infections. Depending on the mutation, severity of symptoms and lifespan of patients vary. Cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, CFTR, is a membrane protein that regulates salt movement in and out of the cells. It is encoded by the CFTR gene, and mutation in the CFTR gene causes defect in the protein in cystic fibrosis patients. Next slide, please. Delta F508 is the most common CFTR mutation in cystic fibrosis patients and then limits the transport of CFTR to cell surface. Orcambi is the only targeted gene therapy for this mutation. However, the drug is effective in only 25% of the patients at a very high cost. Our lab conducts research using super-resolution microscopy, which allows for localization of single molecules. Therefore, we aim to use this technology to determine how mutations impact CFTR distribution on the cell membrane and how this relates to patient responsiveness. Next slide, please. So using the software developed by our collaborator, I analyzed the super resolution images I took and generated the figures shown here. Each spot on the figures represent a single CFTR molecule and they were assigned into different groups based on the distance between molecules. On the left is the region of the cell expressing CFTR wild type, and the mutant is shown on the right. There are more and larger clusters of the protein wild type, color coded green, but almost no cluster with the mutation. Next slide, please. So in the future, we would like to analyze patient cells using the same method to establish a relationship between CFTR mutant and patient responsiveness, and ultimately predict treatment outcomes. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Lydia. And now we have our last speaker of this group. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Max Arsenault, and this is my project titled Promoting Nerve Fiber Growth After a Spinal Cord Injury. And this is under the supervision of Dr. Dena Shariari. Next slide, please. Spinal cord injuries, or SCIs, are a prevalent issue worldwide, 
with hundreds of thousands of people being diagnosed each year and no effective cure available. SCIs occur when nerve fibers in the spinal cord are damaged, preventing signals from passing between the brain and the body. This causes paralysis, among other complications. One of the issues in obtaining functional recovery after an SCI is that the nerve fibers do not spontaneously regenerate after an injury. This is the problem tackled in this project. Next slide, please. Two drugs' efficacies for promoting nerve fiber growth are examined. The first of these is nerve growth factor, or NGF. For optimal nerve fiber growth, a consistent concentration of NGF must be kept for a few months. Additionally, too much NGF can be just as bad as not enough, because with too much NGF, the nerve fibers become content in their location and cease to continue growing. This need for consistency means delivery methods such as pills or routine injections won't suffice. However, NGF on its own is still released too quickly. This graph demonstrates the vast difference an adhesive makes for adhering NGF to a surface. Without adhesive, the graph shows nearly 80% is released after just one day. Conversely, with, with adhesive, less than 10% is released after one day, and less than 40% is released after over 20 days. So in order to have a continuous, consistent release of NGF, an adhesive will be used to adhere NGF to the surface, as seen in the diagram, slowing down the release of NGF. Next slide, please. The second drug explored is arginyl glycyl aspartic acid, or RGD. RGD is one of the natural cell adhesion sequences present in cell adhesion proteins. It will be immobilized on the surface using a crosslinker, as seen in the diagram, such that it does not release from the surface. Nerve fibers will adhere to the RGD bound surface, and with many RGD sequences present on the surface, nerve fiber growth will be promoted along the spinal cord. Further investigation into these two growth promotion methods will lead to continued findings in nerve fiber growth after an, X, an SCI. Next slide, please. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you so much. We will now have the Q&A for these four speakers. So if anyone has any questions, you can put them into the chat. Um, or I can start um, with a question from Max. Um, so both of those situations or both of those um, drug treatments would involve surgery, right? To physically locate an adhesive or a patch of some sort onto the, the place where you are wanting to stimulate nerve growth? Um, so actually it's, I, I didn't mention it in my project, uh, but someone else in the lab who you will be hearing from very shortly um, <laughs> is developing um, a sort of scaffolding system. Um, so that would be actually injectable. Uh, so that would avoid the sort of invasive procedures of surgery. Great. Thank you. Um, I don't see anyone else having submitted anything. So maybe for uh, Lydia and Kisa, um, I guess we can go with the same question that Stephanie had for the, the others. What was the thing that you enjoyed most about your project this summer? We can start with Kisa. Yeah, let's just start. I think um, I come from an engineering background and one of the most amazing things about entering like a microbiology lab was just learning about this whole facet of science that I had just did not have much background in. And the more I learned about the microbiota and how important it is, the more motivated I was to validate this tool so that researchers can ask some really important questions that up to this point we haven't been able to properly answer. So I'm really hopeful as we continue working on this that this can become a, a useful tool for researchers. Great, thanks. Uh, and Lydia? Uh, so what I enjoyed most about this project is to use the super resolution microscopy to actually see single molecules. I think it's really neat to be able to see what you're researching on. Yeah, that is a, it is quite interesting to be able to think about that, uh, that we have the power to be able to see individual molecules like that. Um, okay, and Lucas has mentioned in the comments that he can't actually respond over audio. So if you have any questions for him, put them in the chat and he can answer them there. Uh, and otherwise we can move on with our next speaker. Hi, uh, my name is Miles and I'm from the Sternaca lab. 
My project for this summer focuses on MPRO, a key enzyme in COVID-19. Next slide, please. So what is MPRO? MPRO is a protease that is responsible for cleaving 11 sites of, in one of the proteins. Without the cleavage MPRO provides, COVID will be missing essential proteins for re reproduction. And one of the most uh, important residues in MPRO is cysteine 145, which is essential for the cutting function of the enzyme. Therefore, mutating it to say an alanine will remove its ability to cut. <clears throat> uh, in this project, both the C145A mutant and the wild type will be studied. Uh, next slide, please. Because MPRO is so important on how COVID functions, it is of high interest to us. To figure out how MPRO works, we want to catch it in action attached to each of the 11 sites it's responsible to cut. So to do this, we want to crystallize the protein before shooting it in the X-ray diffractor, which will then give us the structure of the MPRO bound to a site. In order to obtain the MPRO, I first transformed BL21 bacteria with the MPRO DNA, cultured it, induced it for MPRO protein production. Then I lysed the cells, isolated, purified, and finally crystal screened to get the protein crystals. Next slide, please. So when the crystal, uh, so when the crystallation is um, successful, the crystals are often large and rectangular, like on the image in the top right. They usually diffract the best, and they will therefore give the best result and have the highest resolution of structure. And to optimize the size and shape, we vary conditions such as pH, salt, and additive concentration. The best crystals are then handpicked for the fraction. So the image on the bottom is before we optimized and the image at the top is after we optimized. So you can see the size difference and they would give uh, large differences in results. Next slide, please. For future experiments using the structures we generate, we can design candidate drugs to disrupt MPRO functionality. Additionally, there aren't, uh, cysteine 145 isn't the only important um, residue. Another one would be histidine 41. So using that information, a similar project to this one can be done using H41A mutant, which may also help in drug development. Thank you so much for listening. Great, thank you. Next speaker. All right, hello, my name is Nadine, Nadine Truder, and my PI is Dr. Dennis Sharyari. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about a biomaterials-based scaffold to guide axonal growth after a spinal cord injury. Next slide, please. So as was mentioned, so spinal cord injuries um, result in both sensory and motor function loss below the injury site, as you can see on the image on the right there. And this is because at the time of the injury, the cells or nerves in the spinal cord are damaged, and therefore the signal from the brain cannot reach the rest of the body and vice versa. The spinal cord have these cells that have really long portions called axons, and these axons serve to send the signal from that cell to a neighboring cell. And in the spinal cord, as you can see on the image on the left, there's thousands of these axons that are bundled together in what is called nerve fiber tracks. Currently, there's no effective treatment that exists for spinal cord injuries. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So these mentioned damaged axons don't regenerate on their own, and they require some sort of physical guidance to reach their target location, which in this case is on the other end of the injury site in the spinal cord. Otherwise, without this physical guide, these axons just grow in random directions. In the video, you see an injured spinal cord with an implant that's being inserted, and this implant consists of multiple channels. When stimulated to grow, these axons grow through these channels. These implants do have their shortcomings though, because of the surgery that is required to insert them, which makes them a risky procedure. Next slide, please. To avoid the risks, my objective this summer was to develop singular channels that are small enough that they can be ejected into the spinal cord. So multiple of these channels would be injected one at a time. However, after injection, these channels will be in random orientations, so they must be aligned after the injection. And this is because the channel's correct orientation is critical for the proper guidance of the axon's growth direction. Next slide, please. So I have been able to make, inject, and align these channels, as you'll see in the video, which starts with an unaligned channel that then gets aligned by applying an externally applied magnetic field. And on the right, you see an SEM image of a cross-section of one of these channels. So with this work, the next step 
is to inject multiple of these channels into the injury site of a spinal cord and guide the growth of those axons with the hope that it will reestablish the lost cellular connection in the spinal cord. And next slide. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Move on to our next speaker. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Parveen, and my primary investigator was Dr. Shi. And this summer, I worked on a project that explored the potential of convalescent plasma therapy and other experimental therapies as an intervention in the pandemic response. And specifically, I took a look at the CONQUER-1 trial. Next slide, please. So over the last year and a half, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected everyone around the world to varying degrees. One early COVID-19 treatment that underwent rigorous assessment in randomized clinical trials was convalescent plasma. The CONQUER-1 trial investigated the safety efficacy of COVID-19 convalescent plasma as compared to only standard of care for reducing mortality in hospitalized patients. Convalescent plasma contains antibodies from previously infected individuals that putatively boost immunity in recipients once it is transfused in them. Next slide, please. Finding the right donors, meeting regulatory requirements, distributing plasma effectively, and having hospitals prepared to infuse plasma were all challenges faced by the healthcare system during this pandemic. The purpose of this case study is to follow the implementation of Conquer One in BC to inform pandemic planning and to specifically learn about how the healthcare system can continue to improve so that convalescent plasma can reach patients quickly and effectively. And my primary focus of this study was to examine the public health piece of the trial. Next slide, please. Semi-structured interviews with key stakeholders from the Conquer One trial, um, CBS, as well as public health cl clinicians were being conducted. Alongside a unified modeling language diagram has been created to visually represent the flow of activities in the Conquer One trial. The UML serves uh, to inform what interviews are necessary to conduct in the future, and the interviews iteratively helped steer the development of the UML diagram. And this um, diagram can be seen on the next slide at the bottom. Next slide, please. From the initial set of interviews, I learned that robust pandemic plans are being developed. However, they are required to be generic enough as the nature of a pathogen itself is unknown. Therefore, it became apparent that what we need is actually a response plan after being able to identify a pathogen. A data registry was set up by public health in order to help facilitate the process of researchers recruiting COVID-19 survivors for participation in research. This is something that worked very well in the Conquer One trial and is something worth considering in future pandemics. In BC, the strong um, collaboration between public health and CBS was very useful during the trial. However, one thing that I noted uh, in this uh, trial was the fact that it primarily focused on administration of convalescent plasma in acute hospital settings, and we were actually missing a large majority of people in the population. Infrastructure needs to be developed in order for these therapies to actually reach a wider and diverse community. Um, and integrating experimental therapies into pandemic planning is critical when developing pandemic plans in order to actually roll out therapies effectively early on in a pandemic. Next slide, please. And a bit about future direction is after conducting these interviews, um, we will be doing qualitative analysis using a framework matrix as well as in vivo. And finally, we will be working on a knowledge translation package so that the right plasma is able to get to the right patient in a timely, safe, and equitable manner. Thank you for listening and feel free to type your questions in the chat. Great. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to our final speaker for this group. Hi, everyone. My name is Puneet Sidhu. And this summer, my project was educating scientists on risk communication in a public health emergency under the supervision of Dr. Jenna Asprech. Next slide, please. As defined by the World Health Organization, or WHO, risk, communi risk communication is a range of communication capacities required to the preparedness, response, and re recovery phases of a serious public health event. Using this definition, I conducted a 
to literature review on risk communication and interview with health researchers and professionals to, ident to identify the main goals and best practices of risk communication in a public health emergency. I identified that risk communication should increase public trust, increase public awareness, and finally influence the public's behavior. These three goals highlight the important role that risk communication plays in a public health emergency, such as the recent COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. Researchers and, and scientists also have a huge role in a public health emergency, especially one that involves a novel virus such, uh, such as COVID-19. In, in a public health emergency, scientists can communicate and interact with a variety of people, such as policymakers, other scientists, the public, and the media. Therefore, educating young scientists on risk communication can help them improve and learn more about these critical communication networks, especially with policymakers. In addition, understanding risk communication can allow scientists to take um, can allow scientists to better share their research with public health authorities and policymakers to help streamline and take a bigger role in the policy development process. Finally, learning risk communication can allow scientists to engage with the public more effectively and help increase the engagement between science and society. Next slide, please. Even though scientists play a vital role in communicating risk in a public health emergency, they traditionally receive very little training to do this effectively. Therefore, after the literature review and interviews, I developed a lesson plan for teaching graduate and undergraduate students the fundamentals of risk communication. The lesson plan involved an explanation of health policy, um, investigation of risk perception, description of the best practices of risk communication, and finally, an analysis on, of risk communication used in the COVID-19 pandemic. The focus of the lesson is to introduce risk communications to students in an engaging and effective manner. This lesson plan will be used by Dr. This lesson plan will be used by Dr. Ushpech in her science communication course this summer at UBC. And in the future, I hope this lesson plan can be used as a resource for other professionals who want to teach this topic. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Alrighty, we will now move on to our Q&A session. I see a lot of questions in the chat right now, so I will start with Miles, there was a question about crystallization conditions. Is it possible for that to affect the interactions in MPRO? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, no, because um, usually crystallization conditions are pretty mild and shouldn't denature the protein or change how it, um, how, how it can interact with its uh, substrate but it's not outside the realm of possibility. I definitely need to look more into it to give you a perfect answer. But right now, to my knowledge, no. All right, thanks, Miles. Um, Nadine, questions for you. Um, those channels that you made, um, how did you make it and what was it made out of? Yeah, so they're made out of polycaprolactone and so originally they're also made with salt and then the salt gets leached out and removed with water. So then you create these pores in the channels to allow for um, mass transport of oxygen, for example, to get to the cells. And also they have magnetic nanoparticles in them, which is why they're able to um, magnetically align and how they're made. So you need to have the inner diameter pretty small. So we, I take small um, copper wires with 300 micrometer diameter, and then I coat them in the solution and then let it dry. And then that's essentially a few layers of that. And then you remove it from the wire and then you get the channel. Great, thank you. And then Parvin, there is a question about um, figuring out what the right plasma is for the COVID-19 patient. Can you okay. maybe comment about that? Uh, yes, for sure. Well. Um, that was kind of like the focus of um, different entrants, like um, in different parts um, of this implementation study. But I can definitely talk about it um, through the knowledge that I have. In terms of the right plasma, of course, we do need um, a blood type um, match to occur, as well as there is various screenings that were done um, of the donor's blood, one of which was seeing whether or not they had um, enough antibodies, as well as specifically the focus was neutralizing antibodies against um, COVID. So those were some of the things that made the plasma right. 
And related to that about anti-interferon anti, anti antibodies, was there any pre-screening done for that? Uh, yes, there was uh, in the trial itself, yes. Okay, great, thank you. And then Puneet, um, what do you think is the best communication medium for effective public outreach? Um, thank you for the question, but I, th uh, I think specifically um, it, the medium depends on the audience that you're trying to re reach. Some people might prefer um, traditional news and, and media, whereas other people might prefer social media, such as the youth. Uh, but for like an overall, I think like any risk communication strategy should look at a variety of communication mediums to get the message up there. Great, thank you. There's one more question from Dana, um, which if you want to follow up with her over chat, that would be great because we will need to move on to our next set of speakers. Thank you, everybody. All right, go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kwon from the Kim Lab, and today, uh, and I'm working together with the McNagney Lab uh, on a project about how platelet factor four promotes a joint disease severity. Uh, next slide, please. So the disease we're looking at is called rheumatoid arthritis, or RA. Uh, it involves the inflammation of the joints, and currently there's no cure and no known cause for this disease. We know that inflammation can be controlled by cells in the blood called platelets, but we do not know how. Uh, platelet factor four or PF4 is a major protein that's released from platelets and is thought to have a role in this regulation. With that, we hypothesize that the deletion of PF4 would reduce the RA severity. Next slide, please. So our study utilizes two types of mice, the wild type and the PF4 knockout mice. We induced the disease in both of these mice, and we found that uh, after seven days, the PF4 knockout mice has a significantly less uh, increase in the joint size compared to the wild type, as you can see from the plot on the left, where the y-axis indicate the change in the joint size. We also look at the joint image between, uh, between these two types of mice, and we found that there are some inflammation as indicated by the thickening of the synovial me membrane, uh, as you can see where the blue arrow is pointing to. Uh, however, the wild type has a lot more infiltration by the immune cells into the synovial spaces. These data shows that the deletion of PF4 actually reduce uh, the joint inflammation. Next slide, please. Uh, we also look at the weight loss between these two type of mice. Um, as you can see on the plot with, in the plot on the left, and we found that the PF4 knockout mice is significantly, um, has significantly less severe weight loss compared to the wild type, indicating that the knockout mice are less sick than the wild type. Uh, next, we also look at the cartilage damage, as you can see with the images in the middle where the dark blue stain uh, represent the cartilage. Uh, and if you look where, where the red arrow is pointing to, the wild type has uh, significantly less staining, indicating that there's more cartilage loss in the wild type compared to the knockout. And overall, this shows that the deletion of PF4 in, uh, would actually decrease pain and sickness in these RA mice. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, our data support a pro-inflammatory role of PF4 in RA. And again, it support our hypothesis that the deletion of PF4 reduces the disease severity in RA. Thank you. Great, fantastic. Thank you so much. We'll move on to our next speaker. Hey everyone, I'm Rehan, and this summer I work with Dr. Alina Gary at BC, Can BC Cancer to investigate the clinical characteristics and treatment outcomes of plasmablastic lymphoma. Uh, next slide, please. So plasmablastic lymphoma, or PBL, is a very rare and aggressive malignancy. Uh, it is a subtype of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which is a malignancy that affects the B-cells or the antibody-producing cells of the immune system. PBL was first diagnosed in HIV positive patients back in 1997, but it has since been diagnosed in immunocompetent individuals as well. 
PBL, because it presents so aggressively, is typically associated with a poor prognosis. And because the disease is so rare, there have not been any clinical trials, and thus there has there is no current standard of care of therapy. Uh, next slide, please. So to investigate the clinical characteristics and treatment outcomes of PBL and to contribute to the limited literature on this topic, we conducted a retrospective chart review and we accessed patients through the BC Center for Lymphoid Cancer database and found all cases of PBL diagnosed in British Columbia between 1997 and 2019. We accessed patients' medical records and were able to calculate prognostic outcomes one year from the initiation of treatment if patients were eligible, including overall survival and progression-free survival. Next slide, please. So in total, we identified 42 patients with PBL and confirmed their diagnosis through central histology and pathology. Uh, in line with previous case series or the limited number of case series that are out there, uh, the majority of patients were male, they presented with advanced stage disease, and the majority of patients were also immunocompromised, including patients who had HIV and who were chronically immunosuppressed from previous uh, organ transplant. The median age of diagnosis was 56 years. However, patients who were HIV positive were more likely to be diagnosed at a younger age compared to their HIV negative counterparts and those who were chronically immunosuppressed. Next slide, please. So 31 patients received curative therapy, including intercalating agents, as well as, as, well as steroids. 10 patients were treated palliatively due to age or, or other comorbidities. And of patients treated with curative intent, 71% had a complete or partial response. However, 29% of these patients relapsed uh, at a median time of seven months from achieving a complete or partial response. Next slide, please. So overall, the prognostic outcomes were poor. Overall survival and progression-free survival were low at 51% and 47% respectively. And our findings confirm that PBL is aggressive and rare and the, outco the outcomes are poor. And in order to advance treatments, we need to understand the disease process and molecular mechanisms of PBL. And our group is currently doing genome sequencing studies to achieve this. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you so much, Ryan. We'll move on to our next speaker. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ryan Hong. Uh, this summer, I had the pleasure of doing research with Dr. Hurt Haas at the BC Hospital. Uh, where I studied functional impacts of ACE receptor variants on COVID-19 pathophysiology. Next slide, please. COVID-19 pathophysiology is linked to ACE2 in two ways. So starting from the last time panel, on a molecular level, ACE2 is a critical receptor that the SARS-CoV-2 virus uses to bind and facilitate entry into human cells. Physiologically, ACE2 is a negative regulatory factor of a biochemical pathway known as the renin angiotensin system, or RAS, uh, where upon COVID-19 infection, ACE2 expression is downregulated, uh, which goes on to contribute to disease phenotypes such as tissue injury and inflammation, not just in the lungs, but also in extra pulmonary tissues uh, shown in the leftmost figure. So the objective of my project this summer was to explore the functional differences across different ACE2 variants and their correlatory effects on SARS coronavirus induced uh, disease phenotypes. Next slide, please. So how do we test this? Uh, we designed an ACE2 expression vector that had different tags that enable us to measure critical functional features of ACE2, uh, such as protein stability, surface expression, and sars cov binding. And on, on the left is a confocal image of our wild type ACE2 uh, transiently expressed in hector 3 cells, showing all of our markers, uh, GFP and HA, uh, which shows that our expression system works. Uh, next slide, please. So using the aforementioned ACE2 expression system, uh, these are some of the results that we found. Uh, the left figure demonstrates three different functional features of ACE2, as indicated by the black, blue, and red bars. And as you can see here, we saw notable different uh, functional variations across different variants of ACE2 uh, compared to wild of ACE2, uh, especially as seen with the k 341 r mutant, uh, which had significant twofold increases uh, in binding affinity to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we also looked at uh, ACE2 variant effects on catalytic activity, as shown on the right, uh, by looking at ACE2-mediated breakdown of angiotensin II, uh, we saw this overall decreased calic activity across all these ACE2 variants depicted here uh, compared to the wild type. And this kind of more or less indicates that individual ACE2 variants may potentially have large effects, especially in the context of SARS coronavirus to induced tissue injury, if an individual harbors two or more of these variants within the ACE2 gene. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, we were able to successfully characterize functional effects of ACE2 variants, uh, which then allows us to molecularly link SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis uh, to COVID-19 pathophysiology. And these results not only further crystallizes the role of ACE2 and COVID-19 disease phenotypes, but also holistically captures uh, multifunctional effects of these variants. 
Uh, for future research, we would like to explore functional differences between all single amino acid substitutions in the ACE2 gene, as well as its binding to not only Wuhan SARS-CoV-2, but to other key variants of concern, uh, so we can personalize future therapeutics to individual patients. Uh, I'd like to end my talk by thanking CVR for this opportunity, and I'd also like to thank uh, Warren Myers and Sin for their amazing support on this project. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much. That was great. And so in this batch, I forgot to mention before, we have five students in this batch before the, the Q&A session. Um, otherwise, we would have had one student all by themselves in a group. So um, we have two speakers left, and so we can start with the next one now. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Simran Preet, and I had the opportunity to conduct my summer research project at the Hancock Lab. Um, today, I'll be presenting a meta-analysis of COVID-19 disease outcomes. And a meta-analysis is essentially a quantitative analysis of previously published studies that uses statistical methods to aggregate data from multiple studies to potentially reveal new patterns. The effectiveness of current methods that are used to predict COVID-19 disease outcome at the time of hospital admission has been argued. Therefore, we investigated the associations between baseline characteristics that are measured at the time of hospital admission and mortality in hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Next slide, please. To do this, we use the information collected in the HIPSI dashboard, which is a database of molecular changes occurring in humans after vaccination or infection. Shown here are some of the most important columns in the HIPSI dashboard, which include response component, response behavior, and comparison. Next slide, please. This is a flowchart that outlines our process for identifying studies eligible for inclusion in this analysis. So the left side shows the 26 COVID-19 specific studies that were previously included in the HIPSI dashboard. And on the right side, we have 473 new studies that were identified using a PubMed search. And so from our pool of previous studies and new studies, we were able to identify seven studies that were eligible for inclusion in this analysis. Next slide, please. These are the four plots for baseline characteristics that were significantly different between survivors and non-survivors. And so the diamond at the bottom of each plot indicates the overall change in that given characteristic. The plot on the top left shows that platelet levels were significantly lower in COVID-19 non-survivors, whereas the other three plots show that C-reactive protein, IL-6, creatinine levels were all higher in non-survivors. Next slide, please. And so many studies have argued the effectiveness of current methods used to categorize hospitalized patients into groups of mild, moderate, or severe disease. We believe that the associations that are presented in this analysis have the potential to indicate which patients are at a higher risk of mortality, which would help guide their future treatment. However, further research is needed to validate the associations that are presented here as potential prognostic markers. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Fantastic, thanks. Uh, and our final speaker for today is Yasmin. Take it away. Hi, I'm Yasmin. I'm from McNagney Lab, and my project is on chemically induced kidney failure of protoclixin heterozygous mice. Next slide, please. So what is protoclixin? It's a transmembrane protein that's found in your kidney glomeruli. Um, this is where your blood gets filtered, and so waste will be removed, um, and so it's later excreted in the urine. So there are two essential components to the glomeruli. The first are blood vessels highlighted in yellow and then wrapped around these are protocyte cells, which are pointed out in blue. To the right, we see that what is the significance of this in humans? Individuals who are heterozygous or only have one gene copy of protoclixin actually develop scarring at these blood filtration structures. This means proteins that should have been retained start to leak into the urine and this is clinically known as proteinuria or albuminuria. Um, this can develop into chronic kidney disease and is actually the leading cause of kidney transplants. Next slide, please. So in a previous study, we had a mice strain that was completely heterozygous for protoclixin in all of their tissues. When we gave them pyramycin aminonucleoside, or PA, which is a common way to induce kidney disease, all of these mice exhibited proteinuria as well as kidney failure. So my study aim is to determine exactly which tissues need to be protoclixin heterozygous to cause this PA susceptibility. Next slide, please. So my experimental outline involves two strains, um, and that's the protocyte crease as well as the CAD5 crease. Uh, we use these strains because uh, we have one deletion of protoclixin um, 
or both of these strains have one deletion of protoclixin um, in protocyte cells or blood vessels. And so we gave them a treatment of PA on day zero and then collected their urine on day zero, seven and 14, as well as their serum or blood on day 14. And this is because, uh, next slide please. So we could measure their UACR or urine albumin to creatinine ratio. Uh, so creatinine is a natural muscle waste product. Um, and this way we can use it to standardize the levels of albumin that we measure in the urine. Now this means a high UACR value correlates to a highly abnormal level of protein in the urine. So looking at the graph to the right, we see that the wild type and CAD5 Cree strains have no susceptibility or no increased UACR, but the protocyte Crees, which are in dark blue, have significantly elevated levels of UACR or albumin urea. So what we can conclude from this is that the podocyte Cree strain is PA susceptible and that this susceptibility is due to podoclixin heterozygosity in kidney podocyte cells. Next slide, please. Now that we've determined uh, which tissues are responsible for this, uh, our future direction is to verify these results with a larger sample size. Then we can RNA sequence the strain to reveal related genes or uh, pathways. Uh, all of this working towards determining the molecular mechanism of how chronic kidney disease can develop in protoclix and heterozygous individuals. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. Okay, now we'll move on to the Q&A session for this last group of student speakers. So for our first speaker, I wonder if you could comment on how PF4 deletion leads to reduced joint inflammation. Kwan? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, so we suspected that PF4 is involved in the inflammation process. So our experiments uh, shows the phenotype of um, how PF4 can influence the severity of the inflammation in these uh, arthritis mice. Uh, however, we're, however, we haven't gotten into like the detail mechanism and that uh, is potentially our future work. So like we're working to find out the molecular pathway of how PF4 deletion could potentially um, leads to the worsening of um, RA uh, and like the, like how, how it could the, the specific mechanism on how PF4 uh, influenced the disease itself. Great, I hope, uh, I hope that answered the question. That was great, thank you. Um, Ryan, does the ACE2 protein bear carbohydrate, ugh, carbohydrate antigens similar to the ABO blood groups? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so the simple answer is no. Uh, ACE2 protein is a carboxypeptidase and it cleaves peptides and wouldn't bear any carbohydrate antigens uh, they're similar to the BO blood groups, so the answer is no. Great, thanks. Um, okay, Simran Preet, lower platelet counts may be associated with a well-known phenomenon of low platelet counts associated with viral illnesses. How low did the platelet counts go in these studies? Was it low enough to trigger a platelet transfusion? Um, yeah, so I'm not sure what the um, low level would be to trigger pl platelet transfusion, but the lowest we had in non-survivors was 164 times 10 to the power of 9 per liter. So if that's past the level to trigger platelet transfusion, then I assume in some of these individuals that would have happened. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me see. So Rehan, can you describe a little bit um, some of the challenges that you faced with your project this summer? So the major component of my project was to write a manuscript. And I think one of the most difficult parts was actually finding literature on my topic, just because uh, plasmoblastic lymphoma is so rare. And there are over 130 different hematologic malignancies, and this is just mm -hmm. one of them. And there's so much overlap in terms of treatment that they're trying, but in terms of actual studies, there isn't a lot. And so it's only a handful of case series and every case series cites the same articles. And so <laughs> right. I think that was one of the major challenges. Um, but I think that it is, this was, luckily this is one of the larger studies that we were able to do. Um, and I think our data was pretty good. And I think that kind of helped formulate a story, but that was my major challenge this summer. Great, thanks. Uh, and Yasmin, um, maybe you could tell us, uh, let me just scan here. Um, what did you enjoy most about your project this summer? Yeah, um, this was my first time actually working with mice models. So beginning of summer was huge learning curve, <laughs> learning how to work with mice. Um, but definitely my favorite part was working with them. They're very cute. <laughs> right. 
Okay, fantastic. That was a great set of presentations. Again, I learned a lot from all of you. Those were very interesting projects and your presentations were very clear and fantastic. So I think now um, I will hand it off to, um, well, so first I will uh, remind you that you should, all the summer students, you should be submitting two separate forms, the peer evaluation um, and people's choice. And the other attendees should vote for the student who gave the press best presentation. And links will be put in the chat for you to find those um, People's Choice Award links. Uh, and then I will call on Christine, who's going to take a group photo um, of all of the speakers today who did such a great job. So Christine. <laughs> 